David, on your homepage of your website, you've mentioned thinkers you admire, and you list off a number of names. Karl Popper, Michael Faraday, William Godwin, Thomas Macaulay, if I'm getting the pronunciation right, and Richard Feynman. I'm curious to know if you were to recommend to a listener who does not have any physics background to perhaps educate themselves, study two or three of these to begin, who might you suggest they start with? Faraday, his physics is kind of obsolete. The only thing you would learn from Faraday is how to be a physicist. And he was an amazing physicist. If you want to learn actual physics, you wouldn't do it from Faraday. You might do it from Feynman, but even Feynman is a bit out of date now. The physics that I would really, you know, if I didn't know any physics now and I wanted to learn some, I would want to learn quantum physics. And unfortunately, there is no good book on quantum physics for beginners. I hope to write one, but there's a lot of things I hope to write. I'm kind of uh, negotiating writing a textbook with some colleagues. They have to earn their daily bread as well. Zooming out a bit from your question, rather than wanting to have learned something, I would recommend studying or beginning to go into something that looks interesting. So, you know, you can look up those four names on Wikipedia and you will find that Macaulay was a historian and politician and so on, and Feynman was a, a maverick physicist and so on. And then something there might make you want to know more, you know, how could it be? How could it be that you have a problem. How could it be that a person like that becomes recognized as having made great discoveries? So then you can look further and look further and look further. People who read my books will find in the back of each of my two books, there's a list of books that you might like. You know, if you like this, you might like these. And I don't believe in curricula. I don't believe in set subjects or in narrow subjects. Something that interests you is going to be the way to find out what you should be learning. Simply wondering what problems are most interesting to you personally right now. I am working on a new theory in physics called constructor theory. And it is, to me, amazing. And one of the problems I have is how to explain to other people why it is amazing <laughs> and what's good about it. And this is one of the things that you have to do later because the early part of understanding something new, creating something new, is to understand it yourself. And the construct theory has already changed a lot since I first thought of it. And we're beginning to have theoretical applications of it, not yet practical applications. But, you know, one day there will be universal constructors. And universal constructors are to constructor theory what universal computers are to theory of computation. So constructor theory is the theory of all things that can be done and can't be done you know, the distinction between things that can be done and can't be done, considered as a theory of physics. So you reformulate physics to make statements entirely about that, what can and can't be done. And then, you know, Naval, you will like the economic implications. You know, some people think that once we have universal constructors, you realize that a universal constructor can make more universal constructors, and then you have exponentially more of them as time goes on. So there'll be no role for humans anymore. But the exact opposite is true, as usual. Universal constructor, just like a universal computer, is perfectly obedient. It is obedient. Humans are disobedient. You need the disobedient things to program the obedient things. So I spoke a while ago about the fact that gold is eventually going to be cheap because Machines will go out to the asteroids and mine the gold. And those machines, once we have universal constructors, they will be made by other machines. And those machines will be made by, and so on. And eventually, everything will be made by universal constructors. 
And what will people do? Well, toil, physical toil, will be abolished because that can be done by robots that can be built by other robots that can be, and so on, right down to the universal constructor. But when I say can be, they will have to be programmed to be. And if you want something done, either you will download from the internet a program where someone has already worked out how to you know, make a perfect robot butler or whatever. But if you want something new done that hasn't been done before, and you will, then you have to write the program for it. Or hire someone to write the program for it, but then he will want to program in return. There's a Calvin and Hobbes where Calvin has this box that becomes a universal constructor and he starts making copies of himself. So he turns the box upside down, he opens it up, and another Calvin comes out. And so he commands this Calvin to do his homework. And then he creates another Calvin, and that Calvin has to go and do his chores. And sure enough, what he ends up with is a whole bunch of Calvins who are all playing video games and eating food, and none of them actually want to do the chores or the homework, because these are the AGI, these are Calvins. And so, yes, yes. The disobedience is a big one. I will say your, your philosophy has had a huge difference for me on child raising. And I have now realized that it is more important, even through this conversation, it is more important that I have a disobedient child than an obedient child or an yes. educated or learned or whatever I may think is the right set of things because it is fundamentally that disobedience that allows the creativity to come up with new ideas. And it's that creativity that separates us from the robots and the automatons and all of the other things that the universe is full of. In the Enlightenment, a few philosophers and other people realized that this is true of politics. You know, previously, people thought the problem of politics is who should command everyone else, who should rule. And the more obedient people are to that, the better, because if you've got the right person ruling, then all you need for the rest of the society is for everyone to do what he says. If they don't do what he says, then the society is imperfect. In the Enlightenment, people realized that is not what we want. We want to make it so that as much as possible, people aren't ruled. And to the extent that we have not yet completely abolished ruling, society is still imperfect. We haven't got enough knowledge of how to reduce power, political power in society. But we've done very, very well compared with only a few hundred years ago, when not only was power everywhere, but people thought that was the way of things. People thought that that's how things had to be. And the only issue was what should the power make people do? And this leads a little bit to what you have called a moral imperative, which is don't destroy the means of error correction. In fact, the only time I think in your book that you let a little emotion slip through, I would say, is when you were addressing exactly this topic, when you said if we should take it personally, because if people hadn't stopped the growth of knowledge in the past, like has often happened through anti-rational memes or censorship or religion or through just any sort of belief system, even believe in science used as a religious invocation, if people hadn't done that, then you and I might be, I think it is your quote, you and I might be immortal and we might be exploring the stars. And so we should take it personally. Yes. I may have said too much on it, but I, I would love to hear your extrapolation on it. I do take it personally. And, and as far as the, I thought you were going to say, when I said that that's the moral imperative, that not destroying the means of error correction is the moral imperative, I thought uh, you were going to say that that's the only place in the book where I actually tell people what to do. But I, I don't, because I put that into the mouth of a fictional character. It's in a little play that's in the book, and it's the character that says that, not me. You know, the character is Socrates, so I, I'm doing what Plato did. I put my ideas into the mouth of Socrates, and then I don't have to take responsibility for it. So I'm not telling people what to do, <laughs> but if they destroy the means of error correction, they'll regret it. I think this is a great conversation. I think we covered a lot of the introductory topics. Again, I think there's no substitute for reading the books. And, you know, these are books that will make you smarter. You'll have to go slowly and just read them and reread them. I find every time I read them, I get new things out of them. A lot of times 
there are outputs of the worldview that are stated in one or two sentences that you don't appreciate until a third or fourth reading. And there's no points for finishing. There's no points for reading in order. There's no points for going quickly. It's just about understanding. If you want to understand the world around you better and make better decisions, I can't recommend it more highly. I've spent a lot of my time and effort on letting people know what I got out of them, and I hope they will likewise. And we'll put more things in the show notes. We didn't really get to cover constructor theory, which is David's new theory that actually it unites a lot of different pieces of physics, including puts information and knowledge at the center. So I know that his colleague, Chiara Marletto, wrote a great book, The Science of Can and Can't, that tries to explain it to the layperson. There's a great science writer, Logan Chipkin, who's been doing some work on it, and he has a good interview with Kiara, so we I think there are things to read other than my books. <laughs> Popper, you know, what you just said about reading my books, I find that with Popper. In fact, it's rather embarrassing. Sometimes I come across something which I thought was my idea. I always say that all I've done is added footnotes to Popper and Turing and so on. And sometimes I read a passage of Popper and I think to myself, oh my God, he knew, he already knew. And you only get it after having read it several times. So I recommend Popper. And it, 